A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in Kevin. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut in Lusa. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide, Yehuda Geberer. Yehuda Geber with uh, Jewish History Soundbites and this episode about the life and times of Nathan Gutwirt and his role in the Dutch Curaçao visas has been generously sponsored by his children, the Vossing, Schmerling and Gutwirt families. Um, unfortunately, uh, open uh, just to mention the terrible and horrifying tragedy which uh, just took place last night in Marom. And there's really no words to describe the depths of, uh, of such a tragedy. Um, our thoughts and our prayers are with the victims, their families, and of course for the recovery of the injured. And um, may no one uh, ever experience any more suffering. Um, and um, when you move on to um, this episode, before we do that, I want to um, mention we just recently had a, an episode on the Kloisenberger Rebbe, Rebbe Kassili Yudha Alberstam. Um, got an enormous amount of feedback, some great stories. Uh, so I want to thank all the listeners who provide really it was, uh, um, you know, not, unusual for uh, um, a regular episode. The, the volume of great stories and, and uh, good um, tidbits that I got. Um, most of them I'll save for, will be very useful for a future episode about him. I'll save it for that. Must have struck a chord uh, with uh, a lot of the listeners. So I'll just share a couple of the letters that I got for now, and we'll save all the rest for hopefully a, a, a part two. Uh, so here's one letter. Thank you for pointing out about his, his post-war shift, which was quite nuanced, and he did not become a Zionist by any definition. Uh, I think there was even a recently a wedding between Sanz and Toldos Aaron. The only reason this shift became such a flashpoint was only because he was the son-in-law of the Atzi Chaim of Sigit and a grandson of the Divri Chaim of Sanz. If his last name would have been Schwartz or Friedman, no one would have even noticed the shift. I heard they once asked the Satmarov why he was so belligerent against the Kleisenberger Rebbe, and when, when he got along with well with others who were well to the left of the Kleisenberger Rebbe. And he supposedly answered, that's because he is one of us. Okay, so there's a, a take on that also. And here's another one on the same topic. As you alluded to, there was heavy friction, if not warfare, with the Satmarov on a laundry list of issues. When Rabbi Eilish passed away and Rabbi Meisha took over, it died down except for the Zionism issue. The Kleisenberger Rebbe quipped, Arba... Arbe bime yoyel shel chamesh minim, u bime moishe shel min echad, which is paraphrasing Rashi in the beginning of Parshas Bay about the plague of locusts, that in the times of yoyel there was five types of of this maka, of this plague, and in the times of Moshe Rabbeinu there was only one uh, um, species, excuse me, of of, uh, of locusts during the plague. So he was paraphrasing that in the times of yoyel, the times of the Satmarav, there was a lot of complaints that the Satmar had on him. In the times of his nephew, Reb Meisha Teitelbaum, who took over, there was only one issue, which was the Zionism. So that's kind of cute as well. Um, here's another story. is also a powerful story. I heard this from my father-in-law, who was in attendance at a meeting of rabbis 
In the USA, a little prior to the outbreak of the Six-Day War, some rabbis had flown in from Israel, and obviously they were all discussing the situation, which, as you know, looked bleak. One of the Rosh Yeshiva from Israel commented on the situation by saying that things were terrible because the boys were not able to focus on their Torah studies. The Rebbe disagreed with him vehemently and said that the focus should be on Klal Yisrael's survival and not on his Talmidim's Torah study. Very, very interesting. Okay, so we're going to go into the story of Nathan Gutfried. I want to say, open up like this. The, this this is a an introduction to what's going to be a longer series. I um, haven't done a, an in-depth series for quite a while, quite some time. And we have touched on slightly different angles of the topic of the escape from Lithuania and Poland to the Far East, to Japan, to Shanghai, um, many refugees, thousands of them, among whom a contingent was the 300 uh, students of the Mir Yeshiva. We've touched on that when we talked about Rameir Ashkenazi. I had an episode about him, who was the rabbi in Shanghai. We talked about it when I had an episode about the international date line. We touched on it in a different way, way long ago, when I spoke about the Chinese consul Feng Shanho in Vienna and how the Viennese Jews arrived already in 1938 and 1939 to Shanghai way before the Polish Jews did. In other words, I've beat around the bush for a while and I'm going to beat around the bush again today because today I'm focusing on Nathan Gutwirt and his role in the story. But what I've decided is that uh, this is something that we need to do in a comprehensive fashion, an entire series, and do it more in depth. So hopefully sometime over this late summer or early fall, I haven't decided yet when I'm going to launch it, but I will do it uh, systematically, comprehensively, and from the story from the beginning to end. So we should look at this, today's uh, episode, as not even a part one, but rather as an introduction or a teaser to what's going to be a a very, very interesting series. And of course, um, if this is a topic that interests you, then you can be in touch with me. Uh, uh, to sponsor one of those episodes, probably going to be quite long, probably going to be, I imagine, six or eight or even longer uh, parts, maybe even ten. We'll see how long uh, it takes to go through. It's a lot of angles to the story. Today I'm going to um, just focus on, on the testimony of Nathan Gutfier himself and the background as to who he was and, uh, and his life story, which is in general interesting, not just about uh, World War II. Um, I'm going to start off with actually something completely unrelated. Um, I, I, I was guilty of heresy. I asked a heretical question um, one time, and uh, I think it's a good way to open up the whole topic. I, I was in Yad Vashem, and I happened to meet the head of the uh, division, uh, section of Yad Vashem, that deals with the recognition of the righteous among the nations. And I said, you have a minute, I have a question for you that's been bothering me for quite a while. Now, he runs the whole division. It's a, you know, a very prestigious position, and he's quite knowledgeable. And I said to him, Chiyuni Sugihara, the Japanese consul who issued all those visas, uh, I, have, I have a question. The question is, is that there are three criteria that Yad Vashem uses to recognize someone who is righteous among the nations. Number one is the most obvious one, that he has to be a non-Jew. Number two, that he risked his life uh, to save other Jews, to at least to attempt to save other Jews during that time. And uh, that, that second clause, they squeeze a little bit, but even if you don't risk your life, but if at least you put your security or future somehow at risk, that also qualifies. And the third criteria is that you did not take anything in return. You didn't take uh, money or anything else. There are many, many ways of taking things in return. In, uh, in 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 lieu of of uh, you know as payment uh, for saving the life, so that would disqualify. It would make someone a great person still because they still risk their lives, even if they took money or something else. They're, they're a savior. They they can get a lot of other titles, but they're not. They don't get the title of righteous among the nations. So I said I have a heretical question to ask, because seemingly besides for these three criteria, there's a basic assumption that anything about a righteous among the nation is assuming. And that basic assumption is, is that the action took place under Nazi occupation. So he said, well, obviously that's the case. You know, it has to be it was under Nazi occupation. If it wasn't under Nazi occupation, then 
then uh, then there's no story. Then uh, then they didn't save anyone. You know, the final solution was for Jews under Nazi occupation because the Nazis could not exterminate Jews who were not, uh, uh, you know, in places occupied by them. So I said, if that's the case, Shiyuni Sugihara was operating in a country that was not under Nazi occupation. It was territory that was at first independent Lithuania, and later on it was Soviet Russia, which might have been a bad place, but it was not Nazi occupation. So why is he considered a righteous among the nations? <gasps> oh my goodness. And once I articulated the words, I couldn't believe that I had asked them such heresy. Holocaust heresy. Uh, so almost like Holocaust denial, God forbid. So uh, so uh, so he looks at me and he says, uh, you're right. You're right, it was not under Nazi occupation and therefore it shouldn't be considered an act of righteous among the nations. However, someone like Sugihara was such a hero and so universally acclaimed and so many people involved in the story that we couldn't not do it. It just had to be like an exception. So this is a perfect example uh, of a story that is so famous and yet still so misunderstood. And there's a lot of context that needs to be put in order, lots of background, lots of details. And there's an enormous amount of sources out there. There's been books and articles and even videos that will be written and produced about it. It's almost too numerous to mention. When we officially launch the series, I will produce a list of the good books and articles. For now, I'm going to focus on the ones pertaining to Nathan Gutfried, primarily his own testimony. Um, and and But that, that story just gives us an idea of, of it's important to understand the context about what's going on, what's really happening in the background. Now, of course, the fact that Sugihara got these people out of Soviet Russia, and a year later the Nazis invaded Soviet Russia, and they killed all the Jews in the area, so ultimately he did save lives of people who would have been in under Nazi occupation had they not gotten the visas a year earlier. But that's 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 a different story. That's not... That's not the that's not the same as as uh, the way we look at uh, the story of, of any other righteous among the nations. So, no one's denying a, a hero, and no one's denying the story, and everyone can relax. And I can't wait to get, till I get all the hate mail about this, but uh, protesting. But I think that this is also a perfect teaser for what's going to be when we ultimately discuss uh, that story and and all the nuances and uh, and 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 give it the uh, correct uh, context. Um, so this introductory episode will discuss uh, Gutwirt, his life, his role, and uh, and um, you know there's also different versions. Was was Nathan Gutwirt the first one to get get the the visas, or were there other people involved, and was there other families with Lewins or others? And we'll try to cl- clarify a few of those disputes as well because they're not contradictory uh, narratives. There are many heroes in this story, and lots of things were going on at once, and it was a tumultuous time, and not very many things were coordinated in an organized fashion, given the chaotic circumstances. So there was a lot of things going on at once, and uh, and uh, just because one person was involved doesn't negate that other people were involved also. So Nathan Gutwirt was born in Antwerp, Belgium, in 1916. As a, as a young child, the family moves to a suburb of the Hague, in Holland, where they become Dutch citizens, which is important to the story. And he studies at the Haida Yeshiva, which was a very uh, important yeshiva in in Haida, in, in, in Belgium. Uh, the Rosh Yeshiva's name was Rosh Feivel Shapiro, who came from a Kelm uh, family in Eastern Europe. And this was a yeshiva that sent many students to the Mir and other yeshivas in Eastern Europe. And and uh, and Gutfried himself was sent to study in Tells in 1936. And learning in Tells was a turning point in his life. He was amazed not only by the yeshiva, but he was also impressed with the lifestyle, the simplicity, and the character of Lithuanian Jews in general. Another historical tidbit is that, it, allegedly, Nathan Gutfried got to know in Tells Ramatul Pagamanski, the, the superstar of the Lithuanian Torah world at that time, and he recommended him to his former Rosh Yeshiva in Haida, Reb Shraga Feivel Shapiro, who subsequently hired him as a Rebbe in the Haida Yeshiva for a short time and uh, until until Rebato Pargamansky returned to Eastern Europe uh, close to the uh, outbreak of the war. Um, also close to the outbreak of the war, Nathan Gutwirt gets engaged in Kovna, uh, which is not that far from Tells, to a young lady, Nechama Mintz, who came from a Chabad family in Kovna. So for those who thought that there were no Hasidim in a Litvish city like Kovna, so think again. 
It was a very prestigious Chabad Lubavitcher family in Kovna that he got engaged to. So he was in the Tells Kovna area and engaged when the war broke out. And um, so I'm going to get back to the war breaking out in just a minute. I want to finish first his life story. So he goes through the whole war with the whole story, and he ends up, uh, after he get, escapes from uh, Eastern Europe, he ends up in Indonesia, which was a Dutch colony at the time, and it was known as the Dutch East Indies. And there, that's where he got. He married his wife, his fiancée, who he rescued together with him. He did not make it to Curaçao, which was originally his destination. He made it to Indonesia. He actually wanted to get there because it was close to the United States, which was his ultimate destination. Um, so he, um, he uh, got drafted into the, the uh, Dutch army um, when, uh, when the Japanese went to war. Uh, against uh, first the United States with Pearl Harbor and then with England and, and Holland and everyone else in the Southeast Asia. And he gets captured by the Japanese as a prisoner of war and spends three and a half years in Japanese internment camps. Following the war, Gutwirt returns to Europe a couple of years after the war and then he moves to the United States in 1947 where he lived for uh, over a decade, 11 years. In 1958, he returns to Europe and settles down in Antwerp, which is where he had lived uh, previously. And he worked in the diamonds. He was successful in the diamond industry. He was a very quiet, modest, uh, simple man. He did not talk much. Very involved in, 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 in a great amounts of chesed, tzedakah, charity, and, and, and a myriad of, of projects. He expended great efforts in establishing communal institutions in Antwerp in the post-war, including a school for special needs children. Very charitable individual and assisted many, many people along the way. Um, so if we go, you know, and he lived a nice long life, children, family, and, and as we say, happily ever after. Um, but if we get back to the story of the war's outbreak and how he was involved in, in this story that we'll get to in the extended series. So in the years before the war, he was once walking in Kovna, he happened to be there, and he noticed a sign in Dutch, the Dutch language, which excited him, his native language, for the Philips company. So he decides to go inside. Maybe he'll see a, a, a Lundsman, someone from his home country. And it was a non, non-Jewish non uh, Dutch man named Jan Zwartendjak, who was an executive or, or representative of, of, of this uh, Dutch uh, Philips company in, in Lithuania. There was almost no Dutch citizens in the entire country, so they both kind of found each other in a common language and culture and background, this Dutch yeshiva bacher and this non-Jewish businessman, and they became friends. Um, you know, they shared a, you know this common culture far away from home. Uh, Zwarten Diak would, would send him Dutch newspapers to tell. So he had the, the Rotterdam News, or I don't know, the, it, I find it hard to pronounce all these Dutch names, so I have the names of the newspapers, but I'm unable to pronounce them, so just take my word for it that he used to send him uh, Dutch newspapers to read. And they would exchange, they would keep in touch through a lively correspondence, through letters as well. And this background is important to the story because he had this prior relationship with uh, Zwarten Diak. Um, in, the, in, in the future series, when I talk about it in this series that's going to really cover the entire thing in a comprehensive way, there are many angles of the story to be examined. There's the Polish angle and the Polish refugees angle, the Polish embassy of the Polish government in exile. There's the yeshivas. There's the Lithuania as a neutral country. There's the development of the war. There's the Dutch angle. There's the Japanese. There's Soviet Russia. There's Kobe Japan, which plays a role. There's eventually the settling down in Shanghai, China, which is a major part of the story. In other words, there's a huge, multi-diverse story that takes place over time, which has to be covered in a systematic way. And what I'm focusing on is Nathan Gutwirt's crucial role in a very limited one angle of the story, which is the Dutch uh, angle. Um, Another two aspects of the story need to be placed in context is the fact that there was the Nazi invasion of neutral Holland in May of 1940. Uh, They violated in order to bypass the Ardennes, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Maginot line and going through the Ardennes forest. So, uh, so uh, the Wehrmacht, the German army, invades through neutral Belgium and neutral Holland, and uh, they go there into, into northern France. Um, and so that's one thing. So Holland gets knocked out of the war, and they're under Nazi occupation as of May 1940. That's an important uh, thing to understand for the story. Another, another thing to understand is Soviet Russia... 
they took over neutral Lithuania and the neutral Baltic states, Latvia and Estonia, in the summer of that same year, in the summer of 1940, in June, July, and they subsequently incorporated Lithuania into the Soviet Union. So all of a sudden, in the summer of 1940, Lithuania, instead of being an independent republic, is now part of the Soviet Union. That changes things as well. Um, the Dutch government uh, escapes uh, from Holland and establishes a government in exile in London, and its international embassies, as well as its overseas colonies, remain loyal to the government in exile. That's also an important piece of the puzzle. So with the Low Countries under Nazi occupation, Nathan Gutwirt could not return home, so he decided to travel to one of Holland's colonies, and he chose Curaçao as his destination simply because of its proximity to the United States. It's in, it's in uh, not exactly in the Caribbean, but it's, it's in that part of the world. It's near South America, so uh, Suriname, that area. So he wanted to go with his fiance, who is not a Dutch citizen, obviously, uh, she had a family in the United States, so it made more sense to try to get to America. So at this time, he's kind of based in Kovna, and he reconnects with his friend Jan Zwartenjek, who in the interim was appointed as an honorary, honorary consul uh, of the Dutch uh, government in exile. There, this is someone who had zero diplomatic background. He was just working in the Philips Company. In Riga, in Latvia, further north, there was a real Dutch ambassador, and his name was L.P.J. de Decker. And he started, Nathan starts, a, initiates a correspondence with De Decker. So here's the time frame, and it's very important to keep this time frame in mind. In, in, mind. Um, in May of 1940, Holland is occupied by Nazi Germany. June, July, Soviet takeover of the Baltic states, and eventually they incorporate them into the Soviet Union. In August, the famous visa story, which we're going to get to in the series, which, which next time, and in, 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 in whenever I launch it, takes place in August. It starts at the end of July, it goes through a few weeks into August, and that's it. The whole story took place over a two to three week time period. This is all in, of course, several months of 1940. So everything that we talk about happens within this time frame, and it's very, very important to keep that in mind. Um, so he asks De Decker if he... Nathan, as a Dutch citizen, can go to Curaçao. He said, of course you can, you're Dutch. But you know, the Soviets probably won't let you go. So he said, okay, so I can get there if I can take care of the Soviets. What about uh, a few friends of mine, 10, 15 friends of mine, who are not Dutch citizens, or Lithuanian citizens, or, or Polish citizens? So he said, so the Decker says, again, writes to him. They're, they're corresponding. He's in Riga, he's far away. They correspond in the letters. Each time the letter takes time to get back and forth, he says, you should know there's uh, no visa required for Curaçao, but the governor permission is needed, and he probably won't give you per give permission for non-Dutch. You, as a Dutch, obviously, could go there uh, freely. So he sends another letter, and he says, can you give a written statement that no visa is required for Curaçao? And he finally, uh, seemingly, from, from Gutfried's perspective in his testimony, he says, it seemed that he gave in to my nagging. Uh, and he authorized Zvartan Diak, who was the uh, honorary consul in, in, uh, in Kovna, and also Gutfried's friend, to do so, to, 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 to give, give a written statement that no visa is required for Curaçao, even for non-Dutch uh, citizens. Now, given the circumstances and the time frame, it would seem obvious that other people who were somehow connected to Dutch or Dutch citizenship would contact the only ambassador in the region, meaning the Decker at this time as well. Why not? It would be a natural uh, inclination of people in that uh, situation. And that's exactly what happened. The Sternheim and Levin families, who were partly Dutch citizens and partly Polish refugees from Ludz, were corresponding with the Decker and Zwartendiek at the same time, grappling with similar issues. And there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, there's always a, 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 you know, big and for some reason important question as to who is first, which is a good question, but uh, I don't know if it's that important. In my opinion, it might not be. Uh, obviously, other people feel it's very important who is first. As it happens, though, Leo and uh, uh, Levi, Levi Sternheim, was one of those Dutch citizens. He was the brother of Peppy Sternheim Levin, who was also corresponding with the Decker. And this Leo Sternheim was good friends with Nathan Gutfeld. So, and they were in touch with each other during this time. And they were talking to each other. They presumably were sharing uh, news with each other also. And they were later worked together in Japan to further assist more refugees when they were stuck in uh, Kobe, Japan. So, in other words, there was, you know, uh, some, some sort of, you know, 
being in touch with each other, different Dutch citizens who are working towards the same goal. Um, now, because what happens next is of primary importance. What happens next is Zarah Varavtig, who's a whole story, who he was, and a lawyer, and a religious lawyer, one of the leaders of the Mizrahi, and uh, one of the heads of the, the whole story of, of getting the visas. He hear, hears about it. He hears uh, from, uh, he hears, who did he hear it from? It's a, also an excellent question, which we'll hopefully get to one day. But either way, he approaches Gutfirt, that's for sure. He comes to Nathan Gutfirt and asks if he can ask Zvatan Diek if he can issue these statements of no visa required for Curacao in Mas. And Zvartan Diek said, yeah, it seems that the Decker, the De- the Decker never put a cap on it. Didn't say how many he's allowed to, to issue, how many of these statements, which to them, in their mind, there was meaningless statements, especially since they didn't think the Soviets would allow anyone out. Um, so he said, yeah, why not? Now, as they say, the rest is history. And uh, we'll talk about that when we get to the series. But this is only the beginning of the story. I didn't even touch on what the actual story was, was about. And you'll notice that I didn't even mention the Japan part, which is not relevant to this part of the story. Um, so we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Be patient. Be big sponsors. And the series will get rolling. And we'll talk about it. But I want to get back to Gutwirt. Uh, the next time Gutwirt was in Kovna, he did not visit Zvartan Diak because he felt uncomfortable for putting him into this uncomfortable uh, position that he, he, you know, he had to give out visas in mass at this point. And he heard that he that Zvartan Diak was mobbed by thousands of refugees. Now Zvartan Diak heard that uh, Gutwirt was in Kovna and hadn't come to visit. So he said, you know, Gutwirt is probably feels uncomfortable that he, that he that he put me into this situation. So they both understood each other to a certain extent. Now he himself, Gutwirt himself, waited around. He, he didn't go right away. Many people got visas before him and they appear on the lists before him because he was simply waiting to finalize the Dutch citizenship for his fiance. He wanted to leave with his, uh, his fiance. So it had to go through the Dutch consul in Helsinki. So in only in December of 1940 was everything uh, formalized uh, and finalized for him and he was able to leave. So earlier or later on the list of the numbers isn't a real uh, great barometer of who was first because he had personal reasons and family reasons for waiting around until later. Now when he gets to Japan, he and Sternheim assist uh, Warhaftig uh, further with rescuing more refugees. In fact, he assisted with the rescue of the Amshin of Areva and some other refugees by soliciting the assistance of another Dutch consul in Kobe, Japan, a fellow by the name of Nicholas de Vude, v- Vude. Um And they were able to reason with him, and he even shared some of the stationery from the consul for them to fill out the, for themselves. This saved the Amshin of Areva and others from being deported back to the Soviet Union. And Gutfried stayed in touch with this de Vude, uh, until the 1970s, uh, so that he kept in touch with these people who uh, he was involved with. Nathan Gutwirt and his fiance and the Sternheims and several others who were Dutch made it to the Dutch East Indies, which is today Indonesia. Like I said, a few weeks later, he got married. A few months later, the Japanese declared war. Gutwirt served in the Dutch military and he was captured by the Japanese as a prisoner of war. And he spent the balance of the war in Japanese internment until the end of the Pacific War in August of 1945. Happens to be he didn't really suffer from the Japanese themselves, but more from the conditions of the camp and the terrible weather in that part of the world. And Nathan felt that his suffering did not compare to the suffering of his brethren in Europe, and therefore for the rest of his life did not dwell too much on what had happened to him during that time period. After the war, he organized Jewish life among the Dutch Jewish community in Indonesia, and he emerged as one of its leaders. Uh, he made a very special, he even made a special trip to Singapore to purchase toys for the children of the community. Interestingly enough, in the end of 1946, he returned to Holland, where he first uh, confronted the extent of the devastation and the trauma of what had taken place uh, to European Jewry, and from there he moved to the United States. He never tooted his own horn. He never emphasized his role in the rescue. He was very modest. He never saw himself as a hero, just in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. There's one last point that may help to even further understand his personal story is that he had a very strong personality and a very independent streak. Very often he went against convention and against public opinion. He was an independent thinker and he very often thought out of the box and he uh, acted in that way. So that may have also influenced the way he behaved during that time. So I hope this was a good teaser and I hope we get to that uh, series as well. And I hope this also brings to light the great story of uh, a very heroic individual and his role that he played in saving so much Jewish life during that uh, time. So this is Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudaGeber.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, lectures, and sponsorships. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites 
on Podbean or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter at JSoundbites, and I hope you enjoyed.